like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar Series. Thanks for joining us. We have a great speaker today, Andre Glukov, who's an expert on DNA damage and senescence and aging. Um, I want to remind you to use the Q&A function while he's giving his talk if you have questions, and we'll try to uh, collate those and ask them. Um, I don't know if, uh, uh, I, I always forget to uh, mention my producer, Joe Augustine, but I wanted to mention him today. He does such a great job. He reminded me that one should not wear a green shirt to a show with a green screen. Uh, and so if my chest starts disappearing, that, that it's, not, it's not his fault, it's my fault. I offered to take the shirt off and go without, but he said that was a bad idea. So uh, we're just gonna have to deal with the green shirt today. Sorry about that. Um, before we go to Andre, uh, uh, we, I've asked one of the people in my lab, Indrik Vijaya, to talk about a recent research paper uh, titled Restoring Metabolism of Myeloid Cells Reverses Cognitive Decline in Aging. Indrik? Thank you. As it has been mentioned, my name is Indrik Vijaya, and today I'll be sharing an interesting research done by Katrin Anderson's lab at Stanford, which was published in Nature earlier this year. This potentially can help researchers to de age the brain by, adapt, by adjusting the immune system. This paper investigates a molecular pathway between prostaglandin E2, PGE2, a pro-inflammatory driver produced by macrophages, and one of its receptors, EP2. This pathway present in myeloid cells could potentially be targeted to restore healthy immune system activity in both the body and the brain, and thus, delay or even reverse the inflammation process as aging progresses. Testing this in human cells, the authors discovered that older macrophages produce more PGE2, and, also, and it also had far greater levels of EP2 on their surfaces. This double whammy or positive feedback loop leads to a metabolic dysfunction in the cells. And given the link between cellular metabolism and myeloid cell function, they tested whether PGE2 signaling affected energy production. It turns out that this suppresses both cellular respiration, measured as OCR, and glycolysis, measured as ECAR, the two pathways that generate energy. To determine this causal link, they treated the macrophages with two EP2 inhibitors, where they observed an increase in OCR and ECAR in macrophages. The authors then replicated this in genetically altered young and aged mice, where they also found that there was an increase in the plasma and brain cortex PGE2 level. Similar to what happened in human macrophages, deletion of EP2 in aging mice led to an increased OCR and ECAR in mice macrophages. And how does this inhibition of EP2 reduce inflammation and thus aging? The authors then examined signaling cascades downstream of PGE2, EP2 signaling that leads to an inactivation of glycogen synthase GOS1 and glycogen synthesis. When they inhibited EP2 in human macrophages, they observed an inactivation of GOS1 and decreased level of intracellular glycogen. The authors also discovered similar observation in genetically altered mice. 
They dive deeper into the mechanism of this metabolism and discover that increased PG2 and EP2 binding cause myeloid cells to undergo an increasing propensity to hoard glucose by converting this energy source into glycogen instead of spending it on energy. This hoarding and the cell's subsequent chronically energy depleted state drives them into an inflammatory rage, wreaking havoc on aging tissues. And given the association between inflammation and cognitive impairment, the authors then investigated whether a reduction in myeloid EP2 signaling might improve cognitive function in aging mice. The authors observed that all EP2 knockout mice perform as well on tests of object location and maze tasks as young adult mice, suggesting that knockout of EP2 in myeloid is sufficient to rescue spatial memory in aged mice. The authors also had similar observation when they treated young and old mice with C52, an EP2 inhibitor. As the EP2 receptor is highly expressed in aged peripheral myeloid cells, as well as in aged brain microglia, the group examined whether peripheral EP2 locate could reverse age-associated inflammation and hippocampal memory deficits. And intriguingly, mice reap these cognitive benefits even when treated with an inhibitor that does not cross the blood-brain barrier. In summary, the increasing level of inflammatory PGE2 EP2 signaling interferes with the ability of microglia to generate energy and carry out normal cellular processes. And disrupting this may lead to reduced brain inflammation and improved cognition in all the mice. Here are some takeaways that I hope you have enjoyed from this presentation. Firstly, destructive inflammation and cognitive decline in aging may not be a static or permanent condition, but rather that it can be reversed by inhibiting inflammatory PGE2 signaling through the myeloid EP2 receptor. Secondly, restoring the metabolism of certain immune cells are able to restore the youthful metabolism in old cells and reverse age-related cognitive decline. Lastly, inhibition of EP2 in the periphery alone is effective to restore this metabolism. This is very helpful in providing a roadmap for drug makers to develop a compound that can be given to people with similar conditions. And with that, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Andrika. I think that just re-emphasizes what's been discovered in the last uh, decade or so of the really uh, interesting connection between immune cell function and cognitive function. And uh, we're learning more and more how connected these different systems are in the body. Uh, so that brings me to the speaker today, uh, Andre Gutkoff. He's the vice, senior vice president of basic science and the chair of the Department of Cell Stress Biology at Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York. Uh, he's also the founder of several biotech companies, including Genome Protection and the author of about 250 papers. I'm not gonna go through all the details, Andre. I think I'll let you do that. I'll just turn it over and say that the topic today is anti-aging therapies targeting intrinsic mechanisms of genome damage and immunosenescence. Thanks for coming on, Andre. Good time of the day, everybody. Um, thank you, Brian, for uh, this kind introduction and for the opportunity to uh, present um, work of my and, and my colleagues. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this, uh, what I'm going to present, is a collective effort of uh, multiple people who are listed on this slide. And they're representing uh, predominantly three organizations, the company Genome Protection, uh, Roswell Park Comprehensive Center, Cancer Center, and uh, VICA Incorporated. Um, and um, uh, have a number of, uh, we have a number of collaborators which are also listed, and I will mention their names while I'm talking. I also want to um, uh, admit that I am a co-founder and stakeholder of Genome Protection, uh, and um, my research is supported by, by this company. Uh, so um, in this audience, <clears throat> I, I don't need to speak much time explaining uh, what aging is. Um, uh, we would like in our considerations to uh, take um, those parts of aging which everybody uh, agreed on. And I think today it's commonly accepted that mammalian aging is associated with a progressive increase in cells with DNA damage, 
and this DNA damage is intrinsic because it's genetically con uh, controlled, and uh, a gradual decline in immune functions, <clears throat> which uh, normally uh, counteracts the accumulation of these cells, but in the uh, development of immunosenescence, we have gradual increase in the number of the damaged cells, uh, part of which are senescent cells, um, uh, which all together uh, results in uh, acquisition of a chronic systemic sterile inflammation named inflammaging uh, and uh, uh, translated into high risk of uh, acquisition of age-related diseases as well as in uh, all other um, aging traits. So um, the questions which we were intrigued with are, <clears throat> what is the cause of this uh, intrinsic DNA damage? Why cells with damaged DNA induce inflammation? And what are the mechanisms behind immunosenescence? In today's talk, I will not be able to cover um, all the um, data which we accumulated trying to address this question. I'll be mostly focused on the, the first two questions, leaving the, uh, well, uh, the other one uh, for the future if you find it interesting. So, uh, mammalian aging is clearly genetically <clears throat> determined phenomenon. So, if indeed DNA damage and accumulation of cells with DNA damage is one of the uh, founding uh, underlying mechanisms of um, aging, then there should be DNA damage mechanism inherited in our and encoded in our genes. And uh, uh, we, our hypothesis is based on the the presumption that we know the source of this genomic instability uh, mechanism. We connect them with the activity of that part of the genome, which for years has been uh, somewhat ignored by mm, functional biology. About half of our genes are represented by highly repetitive elements, all of which originated from the mechanisms of reverse transcription. We named them retro elements or retro transposons. And, uh, uh, Altogether, they, um, diff differing from one species to another, occupy about 50% of our DNA and are represented by millions of copies and several uh, subfamilies. Two biggest ones are named signs and lines, standing for short and long interspersed nuclear elements. So um, uh, normally these elements are under negative epigenetic control and uh, being wrapped in heterochromatin. However, rarely, uh, when uh, desilencing occurs, uh, the most important element which drives the rest of the show named line one, which encodes two proteins gets activated. It's mRNA in cytoplasm synthesizes two proteins named ORF1 and ORF2. And ORF2, which is actually a multifunctional enzyme containing reverse transcriptase and endonuclease activity. Uh, these two proteins form a cytoplasmic organelle uh, which altogether drives uh, synthesis of cDNA from this mRNA and its integration into uh, nuclear DNA, which is accompanied with the uh, creation of DNA breaks. So this altogether leads to multiple mutagenic events, including insertion of new uh, elements into new places, deletions and amplifications provoked by homologous recombination among freshly inherited new copies, appearance of point mutations due to activity on the nuclease, and uh, also the integration of new uh, copies create epigenetic changes. <clears throat> and altogether, this activity is recognized by the cell as attack of a viruses, and the cell activates uh, interferon response as an attempt to uh, counteract that, uh, causing a local inflammation. So uh, we are deeply studying this process by uh, introducing inducible line one element into the cell. And uh, you can appreciate what we see here. So these are HeLa cells. Without induction, you do not see either of the proteins of line one and you have uh, modest DNA damage. However, when you activate it by doxycycline, you see uh, appearance of both proteins. Um, you, you see formation in cytoplasm of granules, which seem to be like uh, virus-like particles for line one. And this is translated into <clears throat> DNA damage. Uh, which illustrates this mutagenic effect of uh, line one elements. But I want to remind you that they drive not only integration of themselves, but also by other classes of RNA, uh, including sign one elements. So some time ago, about two years ago, um, we uh, connected this uh, if, uh, phenomenon with inflammation. 
Uh, this is the um, a picture from the recent paper we published in collaboration with Vera Garbunova's group in Rochester, um, which in which it, it was shown that in the mice, which have, uh, due to genetic defect, unleashed expression of line one elements, they live under constant inflammation. Uh, this inflammation is driven by recognition of um, cDNA in cytoplasm through CGAS sting pathway. And most importantly, you can stop this process by using reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which altogether, uh, when you give it to either this mice or old mice, reduce inflammation, which can be is manifested by reduction of uh, levels of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines in circulation uh, and the prolonged life of these mice. So um, all this together allowed us to uh, provide hypothetical but well mm, supported by evidence answers to first two questions. So as the cause of DNA damage, we believe uh, uh, is that it is the genotoxic stress um, caused by activated plethora of retro elements, which we named uh, retrobiome, because I think that half of our genome deserves a term, which leads to accumulation of cells with damaged DNA in somatic tissues, which is accompanied with uh, tissue malfunctioning in reduction in gener regeneration capabilities. So, and uh, the reason this process induces inflammation because retrobiome activation leads to interferon uh, response. And uh, there is a growing body of evidence in favor of this, um, of this uh, views in the literature. So next, if retrobiome plays such an important role in accumulation of cells with damaged DNA and inflammation, can we, uh, can we define it as a retro, as a longevity timer, that mysterious genetically encoded property which limits our life? Let's look back into evolution. Uh, where um, do, uh, do these um, elements come from? Uh, they, uh, they came from uh, the massive invasion into the genomes of our common predecessors, uh, which happened uh, sometime the, the biggest explosion of <clears throat> acquisition of these re retro elements into the genome of uh, common predecessors of all um, mammals happened about <clears throat> at the same time when dinosaurs die. Paleontological evidence indicates that about 100 million years ago, there were mammals, but there was not a big diversity of species. There was no zoo. There would be very boring zoo. However, later down the road, uh, within a very short, relatively short evolutionary time, all the diversity of current mammalian world appeared. And after that, evolution was, uh, did not created any big morphological inventions, but instead there was kind of classical Darwin's evolution for adaptation. So, and this appearance of morphological diversity coincided with massive invasion of retro elements of site origin into the genomes. And we can prove it because every um, lineage of uh, mammals uh, every order of mammals have their own class of signs, meaning that this sign invasion most likely created the morphological diversity. Our belief is that together with acquisition of signs, we acquired the clock of, uh, of life because we uh, acquired certain probability of their epigenetic activation, which creates the pace for appearance of cells with damaged DNA creating personal species-specific generator of DNA damage and supporting and uh, creating the foundation for our hypothesis as retrobiome being the major source of uh, DNA damage. Let's look what kind of arguments we have in favor uh, of this hypothesis. The uh, first question is that if this is, it would be true, then the less retrobiome activity we have, the longer is lifespan. We cannot control it well today yet, but what we could do, we could look back in evolution by comparing the activity of retrobiome by the pace of its appearance of new copies, comparing a species which dramatically differ in longevity within rodent world, uh, mouse and rat versus naked mole rat, which uh, lifespan is about 10 times different. So in order to follow the um, pace of retrobiome acquisition, uh, we uh, didn't look at lines of signs themselves because there are millions of copies of them and it's very hard to do bioinformatic on them. But we looked at the side products of reverse transcription because sometimes reverse uh, transcriptase 
make copies of regular mRNAs, spliced RNAs, creating pseudogens, intronless, promoterless copies of mRNA. And since there are only uh, several thousands of them, uh, we can e relatively easily analyze them. The hypothesis we tested is the following. Uh, pseudogen acquisition uh, leads to appearance of these uh, pieces of DNA, which completely non-functional and therefore are subjects for neutral evolution. They acquire mutations uh, in a, which are not corrected. So which means that the older is the pseudogen, the more it is diverged from its mRNA. So we um, made a me methodology. Uh, this work was done by two brilliant bioinformaticians, Valery Kogan and Ivan Molotsov, um, and it soon will be published. So, uh, and uh, we identified uh, all the pseudogens in mouse, uh, rat, and uh, naked mole rat genomes. And then we uh, classified them into the classes depending on how far they evolved from their own mRNA, which will be kind of a building a time machine. The bigger the uh, deviation, the older is the gene. And when we compared the distribution of uh, these histograms, we found a uh, you know, shocking difference between mouse or a rat and naked mole rat. What you see here is uh, looking back in the past. So uh, the further to the right, the, we're going to about 20 million years to the past. You see that there is a certain um, frequency of acquisition of pseudogens depending on the time. And you see that while in mice, it was a more or less uh, the same pace of the process with only some increase in the very end, most likely associated with the um, mouse, um, uh, you know, keeping inbred mice in the lab. Uh, but in naked mole rat situation is completely different. They pass through the period of extremely high level of acquisition of pseudogens about 7 million years ago, and they'd have absolutely no uh, uh, pseudogens which will be identical in uh, uh, structure to the mRNAs, unless all other species we tested. So this all brought us to the idea that long ago, the common predecessor of all rodents evolved. And then in some sublineage of that, there was a massive uh, period of massive in, in, intrusion of uh, retro elements, which created a big um, genetic catastrophe. And those and m many lineages died. And common predecessor of naked mole rats happened to acquire a mechanism which stopped retro biome from amplification, and they gave rise to current naked mole rats, which we enjoy. This does not prove that retro elements are driving aging, but provides a nice illustration to this hypothesis. So <clears throat> the next question is, does expansion of retro biome occur in somatic cells during aging? We still, it's, it's not very trivial bioinformatic, um, uh, bioinformatic um, question uh, task because there are millions of them. And um, we address this question nevertheless uh, using collaboration with um, Tauber Center for Bioinformatic in um, Haifa, University of Haifa in Israel with Leonid Brodsky is ahead of that. And uh, we use this to analyze, um, uh, to analyze the genomes of dogs. The reason we took dogs is um, very simple. Uh, dog uh, is by far the most diverse uh, species with most big range of diversity of appearances. So, and whenever we know, wherever we know what is the gene which determines short legs of corgi, of plain nose of boxer, every time it is a retro element sitting in a new position. So, which means that that process which I described to you as evolution and origin of mammalian diversity is most likely happening during evolution, microevolution of dogs and creation of this huge diversity of appearances. So in which retroactive retrobiome acting as a morphogenes. And so, uh, and so what we did, we, first of all, uh, we established a, a not-for-profit organization named VICA, uh, which is located in Ithaca, New York at the, the prem campus of uh, Cornell University, where we keep about hundred retired sled dogs and we follow their, um, their, their longevity. Uh, uh, we, what we did, we took advantage of having uh, DNA samples from the blood of three female Labradors taken several years apart from the same animal. And then uh, we created the bioinformatic tool set allowing us to extract from deep sequencing of this DNA, the events of acquisition of new retro elements. And we, in all three animals we tested, we found that certain classes of cyan elements 
uh, greatly increase in numbers during several years. And we uh, could calculate how many events per year is happening in stem cells of hematopoietic system. So we uh, believe that this number is ranging between 200 and 1,000 events per year. So this is the degree of pressure the somatic cells of dog is, uh, lives uh, with aging. So all this together supports the notion that with time, age, uh, in aging of dogs and most likely all other mammals, retrobiome keeps generating cells with more uh, copies of uh, new elements. And also we analyzed several tumors developed in these dogs and this, this process appeared to be even more profound in tumors. So uh, mimicking what is happening in humans because human tumors now we know very well, massively desilence retrobiome and um, uh, tumors um, actually enjoy uh, genetic diversity in part because retrobiome is very active creating all this flood of mutagenesis. So all this brings us to the following uh, a paradigm that aging in the, within these uh, views can be considered as a viral disease driven by the viruses or virus-like elements encoded in our DNA due to periodic uh, spontaneous desilencing of retrobiome and therefore can be uh, counteracted by antiviral approaches. So this picture resembles the um, uh, modified um, picture for senescent cell-based theory in which senescent cells are simply substituted by cells with active retrobiome, and we believe that these cell populations are greatly intersected. So what can be done based on this picture in, from practical terms? First, you may try to use uh, small molecule inhibitors of retrobiome activity, uh, thanks to the fact that they are all uh, driven by reverse transcriptase, and we have created as uh, humanity, we created lots of reverse transcriptase inhibitors to treat HIV and hepatitis B. Um, also, you can try, as you do for any viral infection, do uh, vaccination or immunotherapy approaches, and of course, try to reverse immunosenescence, which we can blame for the fact that it can no longer allow clearance of these cells by immune system. In order to explore these opportunities, we created an organization, Genome Protection, which uh, generated um, uh, initially already several products in, in that direction and which keeps analyzing these processes. And the rest of the slides will be marked as genome protection slides. So first the question is, is there any chance to uh, prolong the life uh, uh, due to inhibition of reverse transcriptase? Um, in, in order to do that, we use the um, accelerated aging model we recently developed. And this model was based on the observation that we can see activation of line one elements under natural conditions of adipocytic differentiation. So when you activate adipocytic differentiation in mesenchymal cells, you see massive activation of line one elements, which is associated with an pro-inflammatory response. Consistently, if you take mice, which are heavily radiated and already have lots of cells with damaged DNA, and put them on a high-fat diet, these mice die much faster than the mice which are on regular diet. So uh, we believe that this is the model of accelerated aging, which potentially could uh, be uh, driven by this activation of retro elements. To test that, we put these mice on drinking water with stevudin, the nucleoside inhibitor of reverse transcriptase. And you see that we almost completely reverted this uh, sensitivity to high fat diet, indicating that reverse transcription uh, inhibition uh, can counteract obesity-driven uh, premature aging. So um, uh, we, uh, whether it can uh, slow down the naturally occurring chronological aging remains to be shown. So, but how are you going to test this in humans? Uh, we all know that uh, testing of um, humans uh, for anti-aging effects is a, is a challenge. Therefore, uh, we, uh, in our plans is to use retro biome inhibitors first in the context of, of cancer. And as a matter of proof of principle, we use the famous model of mice, which develop breast cancer due to the oncogene driven by mammarian gland specific promoter. So 100% of females in this um, model develop tumors within about a year of age. These tumors are very sensitive to certain chemotherapy and uh, they all respond. However, regardless of continuous application of this chemotherapy, they um, eventually have relapses and die. So what we tried to do, we tried to see how much 
of if counteracting effect on these processes could be done by applying reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So if you take mice and put them on stevudine and look at the tumor occurrence, we see absolutely no effect. Whether they drink water with or without reverse transcriptase inhibitors, tumors appear with the same pace and stevudine has zero effect on tumors, doesn't have direct anti-tumor effect. However, if you add stevudine to those mice which lost tumors to chemotherapy and continue treating with them with chemotherapy in the presence of reverse transcriptase inhibitors, you dramatically delay the occurrence of, uh, uh, of relapses, indicating that uh, treatment of uh, mice uh, uh, with uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors causes a dramatic increase in progression-free survival, <clears throat> uh, indicating that activation of retro elements is a driver of acquisition of multidrug resistance and uh, opens up obvious potential clinical applications, which we are currently exploring. In the clinical trial, we started in Roswell Park in, in cancer patients who are receiving standard of care for small cell lung cancer. And all of them with very few exceptions will relapse within half a year and uh, we'll compare those who will receive on top of the standard of care reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So uh, this actually opens up a very interesting new paradigm that inhibition of reverse transcriptase of line one creates a new class of anti-cancer agents which have no anti-cancer effect directly by themselves, but can suppress cancer creativity and through that suppress cancer progression. So all this together brings us to the following list of messages. So uh, we showed that retrobiome subfamilies undergo progressive expansion in somatic cells during individual life. So a species with exceptional longevity, naked mole rat has exceptionally low proportion of evolutionary young pseudogens indicative of uh, low uh, retrobiome activity um, in their recent past. Systemic inhibition of reverse transcriptase, and we're not showing it here, vaccination against line one antigens have anti-aging effect in mouse models. And retrobiome activity seem to be a major contributor to cancer progression and potentially plausible target for anti-cancer treatment to reduce, uh, to prolong progression-free survival, which we are testing uh, in, uh, uh, in Roswell Park in, uh, in patients. And in parallel, we are driving similar trial, but already with anti-aging implications in our retired sled dogs in Vika in Ithaca. So uh, these are, this opens up uh, the, these anti-aging treatment opportunities, which I just described. So uh, I think we already know that inhibitors of line one uh, may be uh, useful at least for cancer treatment, but we are anxious to see how much uh, difference we can uh, reach when we treat aging. We are actively developing immunotherapeutic and vaccination uh, applications uh, using antigens of line one as a uh, basis for vaccination. And we are uh, in our work strongly focused on the reversion of immunosenescence. Uh, and we have already uh, drugs, experimental drugs, which are working as uh, uh, as drugs capable of restoring ability of old mice to get vaccinated. But my time is over and uh, this may be the topic for the uh, next story um, if we are given this opportunity. So I am coming to the end here, showing this famous, um, uh, famous picture of um, uh, Lucas the Elder uh, showing the fountain of youth. And we believe that our effort may define what is in the water of this fountain. And we believe that inhibitors of reverse transcriptase and immunotherapeutic uh, reagents acting against cells with active retrobiome are at least uh, part of this uh, blend of things which make us younger. Thank you, I will finish here. Thanks, Andre. We should uh, maybe have you on every week. You have so much data that it's... Uh, um... You can, can you get up at 7 a.m. every week for us? <laughs> All right, of course, it will be my pleasure. <clears throat> <laughs> um, I thought I would do just a little bit of clarification because we have a lot of listeners who are not, you know, hardcore scientists here. 
Um, and we use the term senescence in a lot of different ways. So it can be used to mean the, uh, in, in reference to the whole organism, like can, which can senesce and die. It can be used in reference to all kinds of different cell types, which undergo a process called senescence. And you're using the term immunosenescence. So maybe you could uh, just uh, clarify a little bit the difference between those different things. Sure. Uh, indeed, there is a confusion, a terminological confusion here. Um, immunosenescence is obviously uh, not equivalent to cellular senescence. Uh, immunosenescence is a term uh, simply uh, in scientific way uh, explaining the phenomenon of uh, loss of abil ability of immune system to be functional, uh, which is uh, manifested in multiple ways. The most well-known way, uh, m m most important known phenomenon is the reduced ability of elderly people and animals to get vaccinated. I think we'll appreciate this in this COVID-19 era. Uh, and this is uh, accompanied by um, very specific changes in both innate and adaptive immune branches of immunity. So uh, the acquisition of immunosenescence uh, is associated with <clears throat> changes in the myeloid and lymphoid lineages of hematopoiesis, in uh, changes of ratios between uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells, uh, um, as well as in uh, uh, inability of uh, cell immunity to be effective, but at the same time, remaining ability to get activated to uh, foreign uh, in invasions, meaning that the immune system gets inflamed, but impotent. So all this together is named immunosenescence. Thanks. And uh, while we're on the topic, I, you mentioned the idea that retro, retro elements are, uh, invoke responses in cells that are very similar to viruses. And I wonder if you could, uh, by way of elaborating, just you know, talk about that a little bit more, the similarities between those two. Sure. So uh, retro elements are in principle viruses. Uh, they are selfish pieces of nucleic acids which encode information of their own uh, replication. The only difference from common viruses is that they do it inside the cell. And as of today, we do not know proofs about their horizontal transmission. They certainly were able to do that in the past. Otherwise, we would not be filled with them in our genomes. But today, uh, they are, have to um, enjoy their amplification inside the same cell. Uh, the way they do it, they're doing it through reverse transcription. They uh, synthesize, I'm speaking about line one, they synthesize their own long mRNA. This mRNA is transported into the cytoplasm. It is, becomes the template for two proteins only, uh, one of which is a compartmentalizing protein which creates the organelle, and the other one is reverse transcriptase, which makes cDNA copy of this mRNA. And then this old organelle drives this thing back into the nucleus and uh, integrates it into DNA. That's the viral cycle. Uh, since uh, uh, our organism has uh, developed a number of ways how to recognize viruses, distinguishing them from uh, northern natural processes. And one of the important ways to recognize that is to recognize the presence of free DNA in cytoplasm. Normally, we do not have DNA in cytoplasm. We have it only inside mitochondria, which obviously not seen by the controlling agents, agents factors. But when you have DNA synthesized from a uh, retro element, the organism, and there is a special system named C-gas sting pathway, which is aimed to recognize this DNA and through the chain of events activates interferon response, which is a uh, co quite complicated pathway leading to multiple uh, downstream events, one of which is turning cell into inflamed state. It starts producing pro-inflammatory cytokines, attracting immunity to the cell, allowing immune system to recognize it and kill it, so-called find me, kill me signal. So that's pretty much, I think, what I wanted to answer. And so, you know, this is to further confuse the issue. Let's talk about cell senescence for a minute. That so that in, in uh, invocation of the innate immune response is considered to be a driver in cell senescence as well, right? Well, um, two years ago, uh, John C. Devi uh, and uh, uh, colleagues uh, published a paper in Nature um, uh, defining 
the uh, mechanism behind secretory uh, phenotype uh, associated with cellular senescence in vitro. Uh, this uh, phenotype defined by Judy Campisi as SASP, senescence associated secretory phenotype, is believed to be a big contributor to the systemic inflammation in the body when senescent cells get accumulated. So the source and the mechanistic um, explanation why these cells bother uh, inducing the pro-inflammatory response remained unsolved until this paper. Uh, John C. Davis' group showed that uh, the activation of um, the pro-inflammatory response is driven by activation of retrobiome occurring during cell senescence, and the same gas sting pathway, which I mentioned, gets activated there. And SASP is largely driven by interferon response. So getting to the question of DNA damage, you know, the, the, there are all kinds of different DNA damage you can measure. And you, you already commented a little bit on this, just but if you can clarify. So there's lots of DNA damage of different kinds happening with aging. And you're having activation of these retro elements, which is contributing to that. So how much of the DNA damage is coming from this, this pathway and how much of it is occurring through other pathways? Are, are they, how, how linked are all these different mechanisms of DNA damage? Well, I'm clearly biased here because uh, as anybody who is fascinated with an idea thinks that everything is because of them. <laughs> uh, it's only half a joke. <laughs> so um, um, uh, the, reason I, uh, the reason I think that they play a major role in that is the following. First, we see that uh, today we can measure DNA damage in uh, multiple ways, but uh, the most um, easy way is to measure the cellular response to DNA damage, because every time when you have a damaged DNA, you create a repair machinery, and uh, you have a local modification of phosphorylation of histone 2 x uh, And this you can see by immunohistochemical staining. <clears throat> so what we can see that when we activate line one, uh, uh, transcription in the cells, you start seeing massive appearance of indications of DNA damage, meaning that, uh, and the reason for that is most likely the activity of endonuclease, because in order for these elements to get integrated, you need to make a physical hole in DNA to prepare the place for the integration, which means that these elements, whenever they get activated, it, they turn cell into equivalent as if this cell would have a little piece of ura uranium or radium in it. So being all the time under the um, pressure of DNA damage, which requires constant repair. And that, <clears throat> as any radiation, uh, expected to lead to uh, generation of point mutations. We recently finished the work in which we did bioinformatic analysis of cells in which we activated retroelement expression only for four days. And then we stopped it and we cloned the cells, sequenced them, and we already were able to find multiple mutations which they acquired. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, of course, does not prove that those mutations which we acquire with life are driven by the same mechanism, but provides additional support for this idea. Uh, the second thing is that uh, the other type of DNA damage is insertional mutagenesis. But uh, And we also know that another type of chromatin damage, which we acquire with time, is acquisition of new areas of DNA which are under heterochromatin and get suppressed. This is also can be easily connected by toretra elements because remember, naturally occurring repeats, they evolve to be in wrapped chromatin because they are attracting heterochromatization as a matter of their silencing. When you have new copies integrated in new places, you are spreading the heterochromatin areas to other, other places. So the, the, what I want to say is that we have enough evidence to connect these events to the activity. But what, what is real impact, uh, we will know within the next few years. You know, a lot of these like, heterochromatin events are driven by DNA methylation. And a lot of we've had several shows talking about the epigenetic clock and using DNA methylation to measure aging. Uh, do you think the changes in DNA methylation patterns are, are being driven in part by activation of retro elements? Uh, here, I do not have um, that much direct connection, simply because we all know that methylation clock uh, is um, uh, kind of has a pre predominant 
areas where uh, DNA methylation occurs with higher frequency than in others. Retroelement integration is completely random. So um, there is no direct connection between these two things. However, um, we know that DNA methylation comes a, as a consequence of epigenetic silencing acquired at the level of chromatin uh, modification. So which means that if you have massive driving force which changes chromatin, um, chromatin structure, which is then translated into the changes in DNA methylation, this connection may be there. But again, uh, we will be able to analyze it only after we will be able to take DNA from those dogs mm, or mice which lived under constant inhibition of uh, reverse transcriptase and more challenging inhibition of endonuclease because we can inhibit reverse transcriptase but we cannot induce and in, in, uh, reduce uh, the activity of endonuclease as of yet. But when we learn how to do that, we can get direct answers to this question. People think of uh, in the field of this being a relatively late event in aging activation of retro elements. So at what point do you see this in the aging of, a, say, a mouse? And, and is it a progressive event over time or is it a late event during aging? Uh, from what we see in dogs, uh, as I said, we measured that um, taking dogs of, let's say, three and nine years old from the same dog, uh, it does not create a very ancient dog. And, uh, uh, but we also could see what is the proportion of somatic integrations which pre-existed already in the genome by three years of age, which is young age for dog. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that this accumulation occurs during the entire life. It may increase in speed in the end of life, it remains to be shown. It's a hypothesis, we don't have this data. But this is the process which, at least in dogs, is uh, continuing throughout the whole life uh, with certain speed. So, yeah, it, um, it sounds like that it could be a much bigger driver of aging processes than, than people had thought if it's happening throughout life. That's what I'm trying to convince um, uh, everybody, at least, to try it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these retro uh, uh, RTIs, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, were developed to uh, treat you know, viruses. Um, can you talk a little bit more about them as therapeutics? So what is their toxicity profiles? Are they reasonable drugs to actually target normal aging? Well, it's a very interesting and key questions for the future of this uh, treatment for aging. It's supposed to be enormously safe. Uh, because in the absence of uh, very reliable safety data, nobody would ever uh, start using them. Uh, today, um, the anti-HIV field largely um, you know, evolved towards the inhibitors which are not of nucleoside origin and therefore are not inhibiting line one elements. Uh, the, this evolution of the field simply indicates higher uh, safety, better safety profile of allosteric inhibitors versus nucleoside inhibitors. Uh, however, even nucleoside inhibitors, at least several of them, have a very good uh, safety profile and in principle should not be ignored as a, a potential uh, anti-aging anti drugs. Some of them, such as lamivudine, tenofovir, are given to people with HIV for years with no uh, serious side effects. Our own study ongoing in dogs, in which dogs are receiving lamivudine for already two years, did not reveal any pathologies associated with that. So uh, I think that in principle, this approach looks very reasonable and uh, quite op I'm quite optimistic about using um, reverse transcriptase inhibitors uh, as a safe safe drugs. However, I want to remind again, inhibition of polymerase activity most likely is not going to be sufficient. You need to inhibit also another property of reverse transcriptase, which is endonuclease, and this is much more challenging fact, and we do not have uh, approved drugs where we can try it, and genome protection is working on creating uh, drugs with these properties. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I, I want to go to Xiaoping, but I'll ask one more quick question. So just a quick answer. You said something about vaccinated against aging. Can you talk more about that? Um, 
this is the topic for the next probably <laughs> uh, for the next time because you can, you can say it in one in one word. Uh, but I can tell you that since we are based on this, if you wish, viral theory of aging, vaccination against cells uh, which express this endogenous viral antigens is a very straightforward approach, and uh, we are actively exploring it, and we have very intriguing data, which I would prefer not to spend too much time on because you asked me to give a short answer. All right, we'll, uh, we'll get you back for that. Xiaoping, do you have some questions? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, thank you, Brian. Prof Gukov, thank you very much for your talk. That was really inspiring. We have a, very, uh, a wide variety of questions from the floor, and I will just uh, ask a few of them. Maybe we start with a question from uh, Derek who asked, uh, given the implication of retobrium that play a fundamental role in determining the longevity of mammalian life, what would aging in mammal have looked like before the retobrium was introduced? Does this mean that the mammal lived much longer before the, that period? Can, can you address that? Um, I don't think that anybody could live much longer regardless of this, because we know species which would live forever without uh, uh, you know, external challenges. Uh, in real life, any species is, uh, never explores the full longevity which is given by biology because, uh, and I think that uh, these mammals who did not, well, first of all, there were no such mammals which were completely free from retrobiome. When I explained that there was explosion of acquisition of retrobiome uh, uh, elements, it was mostly uh, the explosion of sign elements. Line elements were with us for, for as far back in the future as we can imagine. So, uh, which means that retro elements were there always. Uh, the, uh, uh, however, um, whether they were drivers of aging at that time and uh, whether these animals uh, could, in principle, under ideal conditions of life, live much longer than current ones. Yes, it's a possibility, but I don't think that the reality of life and uh, appearance of uh, challenges, predators, infections, and nothing would allow them to exercise that, as mouse cannot exercise two and a half years of its natural life in real nature, living not longer than eight months, as, as far as we know. Anybody that's watched Jurassic Park, I think, would know that. <laughs> 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 okay, there's another question from uh, Stephen who asked uh, what is the difference between, let's say, the activation of uh, cert 6 and uh, reverse transcriptase inhibition in lower limb, the line one? Why don't you look at other things that are also lower line one? Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. Uh, the, uh, is there, like, if there's a small ke uh, chemical that can let's say, induce cert 6 wouldn't it uh, do the same thing? Oh, you mean, um, I, I think the question is about the natural mechanisms of silencing of line one expression. Uh, yeah. And cert 2 in 6 uh, is one of the important players there. Uh, and uh, uh, since mice with uh, uh, knock, knockout of cert 2 in 6 gene have high levels of retrotranspositions indicate that uh, certain six is one of the players of, of silencing of retro elements. Yes, uh, there is a very uh, intriguing opportunity to improve um, overall uh, situation by allowing the naturally occurring mechanisms of silencing work better. And there is a, uh, I, I know at least about one group which in Israel, which is exploring this um, approach by developing drugs, which would work by activating cert 2 in 6 activity. Uh, I wish them good luck. It, I think it's a great, a, a great approach. Uh, and uh, I think it's one of the great alternatives. So let's see, uh, let's try to see what, which one would work better. So uh, we have a question from Russia. Ms. Olga asked, there was a recent published nature paper about a single cell sequencing method and the role of somatic mutation in aging development. The result was such that the number of somatic mutation grow relatively slow 
linearly with age. And the rate of mutation accumulation is almost independent of the number of cell division. So how the retrobiome hypothesis explain the lack of huge expansion of somatic mutation in the human experimental data if the retrobiome are getting active everywhere? I think there are several questions in this uh, mm -hmm. nice question. Uh, and um, I will try to give short answers uh, to them to the extent I understand it and I know. Uh, obviously, any answer I'm giving is limited to um, our current um, availability of information. Um, well, first, the connection between uh, acquisition of mutations and cell divisions. Indeed, in the, uh, our kind of generic uh, conventional way of thinking, we always connect acquisition of mutations with cell divisions because uh, that's uh, the way how, um, because lots of mutations occur during DNA replication and insufficient DNA repair, uh, uh, which is a, with damage which occurring during uh, replication. The beauty of retrobiome theory is that it does not require cell divisions to uh, to, to, to cause DNA damage. And therefore, uh, the appearance of mutations in non-dividing cell, which uh, without retrobiome is hard to explain, uh, provides a very nice uh, plausible explanation through retrobiome activity and uh, activity of uh, endonuclease. Uh, about the uh, gradual increase in mutation frequency, I think that it does not surprise me at all because remember that um, you, know, you need to distinguish um, two scenarios. One scenario is then when you have a very short lasting and very low activation of line one element in the cell, which let's say create a one or two additional integrations of lines or signs in the same cell. It is very unlikely that this very short lasting mild expression would lead to the degree of interferon activation, which would be recognized by immune system and killing this cell. So if the cell manages to shut down the expression of line one, it will acquire uh, new copies of uh, retro elements, but it would not be uh, selected against. I think that what uh, our organism is struggling with is the cells which severely unleash the activity of elements. And that uh, is very well controlled during our life until the very end, it, it, at least according to our current views. Therefore, I do not see any contradictions here. And I see that um, the views I tried to sell you today, they um, nicely fit to what we observe. One more question from um, Steve, who asks, it's very interesting that the activation of fat cell lead to aging. Is this activation across the whole genome or is it limited to some uh, genomic site? Like, is it systemic for them? This is an excellent question with no answer today. Uh, we have approximately a little bit under a million copies of line one elements, which are spread out all over the chromosomes. Out of this a million copies, only in humans, only 150 are technically intact and capable of being activated. But again, these 150 copies are spread out the whole genome. And knowing that uh, our epigenome is very different in the cells of different differentiations, it would not be surprising that in some differentiations, activation of active lines or intact lines can occur with higher frequency than in others. And this is a great question which can be solved by measuring the speed of retrobiome expansion in different tissues of the same old organism. When it is done, uh, the answer will be received. Okay, well, uh, thank, thank you, Shafing, and also thank you, Andre. That was a fantastic. Uh, discussion and has caused a lot of us to rethink some things about aging. So uh, we'll be interested to hear updates soon. Um, I want to remind everyone to use the panelists and all attendees button if they want to make comments on the show. Uh, please leave your thoughts. Uh, the next speaker will be Tina Woods, who's the CEO and co-founder of Collider Health. And she's been one of the drivers behind getting a, a more uh, political supported approach to targeting healthy aging in the UK. So we'll get an update next week on what's going on in the UK. Um, the topic of her talk is the quest for healthy longevity for all. Uh, and uh, before I leave you, I we always close with a video and you know, uh, it's a, we have a, a, our Dean uh, Chang Yap Singh here at the Yong Lin School has 
very, very important jobs. And one of those is to scour TikTok to find videos for us to show on aging at the end of the show. So he's found the show, the video tonight. It turns out that the speaker is, uh, uh, the comedian for this is Brendan Grace. And the person on TikTok who's mouthing everything the comedian says is James Strachan. So enjoy that and come back next week. Thanks, Andre. Here's a couple of signs of old age. If any of these apply to any of you, you could be on the way out. You know you're getting old when your family talk about you in front of you. <laughs> and then you learn the difference between a house and a home. It's the truth. A home is where they'll put you <laughs> when they get you out of the house. It's true, it's staring us in the face. My eldest daughter came to me recently and she wanted to borrow against the will. <laughs> and then she tried to convince me it was a short-term loan. <laughs> You know you're getting old when you wake up in the morning and your toes outnumber your teeth. <laughs> then you know you're in trouble. You know you're getting old when yourself and your teeth don't sleep together anymore. <laughs> when you wake up in the morning and that smile at your bedside is not the person with whom you went to bed. It's your teeth in a jam jar. <laughs> Like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. 